from the teams and also try and get our head around exactly who might be doing what. I'm Martin Haven, in the booth with me, Anthony Davidson and Graham Goodwin. And Ant, what a mouth-watering grid of cars we have got here. It's amazing. It's the season we're waiting for, isn't it? It's amazing. It's the, a record grid in the top class of the FI World Endurance Championship. It's a record number of manufacturers across, across both classes for any world championship. Um, it's the season we've been waiting for, Martin, and I can't wait to get going. And Anthony, as a driver, whether you're in your position watching this or in their position competing in this, seven rounds of the championship, of course, including the 24 hours of Le Mans, so a lot of variety in race venues, in temperatures, in conditions, and in race duration. It's, it's a massive mix, and, and there's, at the moment, no clue who's going to come out on top in either of our two categories. Yeah, a growing championship is always good to be part of that, uh, no matter which discipline you're, you're working in. And uh, as, as a driver, it's, it's, it's brilliant to come here to a, a brand new circuit for many of them. And uh, yeah. Yeah, here in Qatar, uh, 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 it's, it's a well-trodden path for other disciplines of motorsport, motorbikes, of course, uh, Formula One has been here, but for yeah, a lot of these drivers, it's, uh, it's going to be a new challenge. They've had the prologue here uh, last week and uh, they've, they're, they're, they're getting their teeth into it, but they're still learning as they go because you obviously got so many drivers uh, within each car crew, three usually sharing the same car. Uh, here we are at the LaSalle circuit, 5.419 uh, kilometers clockwise. We're just gonna have a look at turn one here. It's quite a quite a high speed corner. As you come out the pits, it bleeds onto the racing lines. That's one to watch out for, uh, particularly on race day on Saturdays. It's a Saturday race, of course. It winds its way through all the way around to turn six here, the slowest corner on the track, a good opportunity for the hypercars to get past some of the, the slower GT3 cars through the corners before that. And then things start to speed up once again into turn 12, this triple right hand complex of corners, a really important one to get right and to stay within track limits as well. This is qualifying day, of course, we've got this FP3 session coming up now, but in qualifying, your lap times will be deleted if you go off through any of those uh, the corners. And also, we've seen cars get damaged by the pretty severe uh, runoff curbs. Yeah, the curbs, if you drop off the outside of them, can definitely do some damage. Jensen Button, one of the new names in the championship, and Graham, new driver names, new team names, new manufacturers names, and this year, for those who are used to World Endurance, we've gone from three classes, which was Hypercar, LMP2, and GTE, down to two classes. There are no more G no more LMP2 cars in the World Endurance Championship, except for at Le Mans, when LMP2 will be competing again. Yes, spotted there. Pierre Fion, president of the ACO, suited and booted. Yes. Not quite sure what that's all about. Well, probably because he's on pit lane and enjoying this. I'm well, sure no, because right. he was just out in the historic support oh, was race. Indeed? Yeah, driving well, in the historic support race. This is the scale of new, OK? We have 37 cars on this grid. They're about to see it uh, get it uh, running on their outlap. Across those teams, there is one team, a two-car team, that has no change in their car and no change in their driver lineup. Apart from that, it is changed literally everywhere. Yeah. That team, by the way, is the factory Ferrari AF Corsa team. Which is in hypercar. Now, there is also an AF Corsa Ferrari team in GT3. All of the GT cars you will see, all of the cars that look like road supercars, are, that, that's um, Warwick New Zealand, not Warwick. Warwickshire, uh, are brand new to the championship. LMGTE has gone, LMGT3, which is a very slight variation of the normal FIA regulations designed specifically for endurance racing purposes. That is the new GT category. So we have four manufacturers there, some that have never been in the championship before, and that's exactly the same here as well. Alpine endurance team, we had Alpine cars in LMP2, we've had Alpine cars in LMP1 and in hypercar, but this is a purpose-built Alpine hypercar. Returning this year, we've got Cadillac, and Graham, let's just 
run down the entry list. We've, we've got Cadillac Racing, single car here for the full season with Earl Bamber and Alex Lynn, the, uh, the oh. permanent members of the team, if you like. And we expect that at six hour races, it may well be that they run with two drivers, mm -hmm. but Seb Bourdais is here. Yep. Happy birthday for last week, Seb. We won't tell people just which birthday that was, but it wasn't 29 or 30. Or 40. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the caddy here is a solo factory car. Of yep. course, we'll see three of those cars at the Le Mans 24 hours. Um, running down in terms of the numerical order, it's the two Porsche Penske cars, two of five Porsches yep. uh, we've got on this grid with the two Jota cars to come and the retro liveried number 99 Proton car. Yep. Uh, the Porsches have been very, very quick here and have tested here. Toyota are here with their new look batty black livery. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 7 and the 8 with a brand new driver. We'll be hearing all about all the new drivers as we move through. Ferrari, and this is the big news with Ferrari. We've got a privateer car. The, the yellow number 83 car looks absolutely stunning. Uh, has tested. Here's Ye Yefei, and that is how you'll be hearing us refer to him yep. with respect to his Chinese heritage for this season. Uh, joined, of course, by Robert Kubica and Robert Schwartzman. That's a, a very eye-catching lineup indeed. Finishing the rundown of the uh, the, uh, the marks we're seeing here is Sotto Fraschini. More yes. to be told about that. BMW, one of our newcomers here, mm -hmm. but a car that's already raced in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. And run by a team that's got experience here, WRT, one of the leading lights in LMP2 over the last two seasons. They're also running cars in the GT category. One of three teams that are doing so with AF Corsa and with Proton, and we'll talk about their uh, new look GT effort as well. Uh, beyond that, Alpine, we've already seen, that's a stunning car. Peugeot. Probably the final race for the tailless wonder here, and it's been quick. Here. <laughs> it has been quick, isn't that? That's always the way. As soon as you decide to sell your car, suddenly uh, it starts behaving itself again. Right. And the other new car to mention, of course, is the new Lamborghini McLaren here. Yes. McLaren, uh, one of four makes making their WC debuts. It's Lamborghini, it's McLaren, it's Isotta Fraschini, and it's Lexus. Uh, they'll come when we run down through the LMGT3 order. It yeah. is. I said at the start, it's a whole lot of new. There's more new that we can squeeze into one session. Well, it's goodness, ridiculous. Thank goodness we've got a long race in which to sort it all oh, out we because it, there, there are so many new name and driver combinations and so many things that are automatic, like saying, oh, there's the TF Sport Aston Martin. We're going to have to start re-editing those in our head because although TF Sport are here, they're not running Aston Martins. So there are lots of different changes. Proton Competition Porsche, there's the 99 car. So they're running it last year in WeatherTech colours. This year it is in Fat Turbo Express, which is a, a throwback. Good morning in the pit line. This is race control. One minute to open pit line for free practice three. I hope you can all read us loud and clear. Track is clean. Track is dry. We removed all the gravel. Let's hope we can do a clean session without so many track limits as we had yesterday. Wish you all a good session and please turn on Discord so that you can communicate with race control. Some things, I'm glad to say, do not do change. change. And Eduardo Freitas and the whole of the race control crew are still seconds, here with us. Under 30 seconds to open pit exit. Yeah, the fourth member of our booth team, uh, Eduardo Freitas. <laughs> Actually, as soon as we get into the session, we're going to go down to the pit lane as well because there are changes afoot everywhere here. Uh, myself, Graham and Anthony Davidson will be... Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Pit exit is open. Free practice three has started. Yeah, myself, Anthony Davidson, Graham Good will be sharing commentary duties with Eduardo over the uh, entire was season. A with a light at pit exit, but it's the beginning of the season. Let's take it like that. Yeah, okay. Everyone is allowed one. Would you like a fourth go at this? <laughs> <laughs> no, because this is. Oh, I've, I've, I've watched endurance racing a, a long, long time. Last year at Le Mans was uh, a big year. It was the centenary. It was also 40th anniversary since my first ever visit to Le Mans. And I was watching endurance racing before that. I remember when Porsche made their debut at Silverstone in the six hours with a, with a 956. That didn't work and, and sort of was quite slow. And the Group 5 Barquetta Lancias and all the other stuff. But I, and I, have, I don't think I've been as excited about a race 
since Jagger returned to Le Mans and, and suddenly everything started to, to grow into the Group C era that, that we know and love. This is on an entirely stellar different level, I think, to, to anything that I've ever seen before. Anybody that cares about endurance racing can be nothing other than excited and emotional about what lies ahead at this stage. Um, it's it's glorious. It's you know, the depth of it. I mean, walking you guys down pit lane earlier this week took longer than it's ever taken before because yeah. there's so much to look at and so much to talk about and so much to explain. And Wherever you are in the world, it's a very early good morning to you all of you in Europe, if you're listening around. Uh, good morning as well here in Qatar and in the Gulf region. Good afternoon and good evening wherever else you are in the world. And you are more than welcome to join the growing array of fans around the world that have been drawn to this amazing new era. And just look at this. Yeah. Three, uh, four cars in a row. Three well, different cars, and they're very easy to tell them apart. And we're going to play a lot of blue car, red car, because we have got very different shapes here from those we, and different colours than from those we're used to. BMW team run by WRT. Now, these cars are brand new to World Endurance, but they have raced for a year in IMSA. They are IMSA spec LMDH cars, so they've got a mild hybrid rear drive only, whereas the Le Mans hybrid cars, like Peugeot, like the Ferrari, like the Zotto Fraschini, they can use their hybrid system to drive either the rear wheels only or the front wheels only. And as we've become used to reminding ourselves over the last 12, 24 months, the hybrid system, like in your road car, if you have a normal road car rather than a Fandango car, it just replaces the internal combustion engine's power when it's being used. So it's not a turbo boost, it's not overpowering the car like in LMP1. Anthony, the hybrid just blends in and the internal combustion engine, whatever it's fueled by, you know, fairy dust, whatever, the hybrid just replaces some of that when it's in use. Yeah, exactly. So like, you, like you're saying, Martin, it's the, the hybrid boost isn't on top of, it's not an additional power boost to the ICE, the internal combustion engine. When you are getting delivery of the battery power in these cars in hypercar, it actually reduces, cleverly reduces the internal combustion power. So your constant power always stays the same. And there's been changes as well to the way that the GT cars, in all their various different nations, front-ended, mid-ended, rear-engined, V8s, flat sixes and everything else, the way that they are balanced, the balance of performance is being done a little bit more like it is in hypercar, where there is a maximum power allowance per lap or per stint. That's going to be the same. You don't have air restrictors on your BMW GT car, on your Aston Martin GT car. You just have a maximum energy usage per stint, which is measured, as on the hypercars, by torque sensors. So they don't have to check that you're using too much fuel or whatever else. It's all done live, real-time, automatically. And better still, that gives us the opportunity to bring you, and thank you for the graphic on cue, uh, this kind of graphic, which shows you just exactly how well that energy has been managed. Better news still for 2024, we can do that with the GT cars now as well, because yes. that's part of the LMGT3 package. So what you'll be able to see in real time is who has been more efficient with the energy they've got for that stint. And for much of the race, that's going to be largely interesting but slightly academic. Very important for the teams, of course. But when we're getting into the final hour of any race, who's got what fuel, when do they have to stop, how long will they have to stop for, all those things are, are, are things that we can uh, hopefully, with the help of Anthony, understand and, 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 and then yeah, kind of make more of a race of it or, or show how it's developed. And whilst, look, I'm passionate about this sport, I think most people know that, but uh, I do know that those that are passionate about this sport are very sensitive to messing about with the team aspect of it, the strategy aspect of it, the management of all of this, the management of stints. We're going to be coming to a couple of our WC partners in just a short moment about the management of tyres, etc. The best part about the way these rules have been changed and integrated, and there is the new Lamborghini we've seen for the first time, is that they've not taken away from the strategy aspects of this. What they're doing is they're using that technology to observe a monitor performance and to open up this sport to a wider audience with more understanding than we've been able to do before. 
Exactly so. Well, we have two categories, hypercar and GTE, GT3. You can see, there we go, there's a pound already into the jar. It's going to be an expensive season. And we have two different manufacturers. Now, we've got Pierre from uh, Michelin here. Um, two, last year, you were supplying tyres for the hypercar crews. What have you been able to do with last year's information to develop tyres for this year? How much has that changed? Well, to make it simple, we are using exactly the same tyres as last year. So okay. there is no new tyres this season. But uh, we took into account last year when we did the development for 2023 that we will have new uh, car manufacturers this year. And that's why we make a tyre that can work abroad all these type of cars. So we still have uh, no tyre no tire preheating, no tyre warming, but everybody, or half the hypercar field at least, have a year's experience of that, and so the newcomers, obviously, they will have to catch up. Now, your tyre engineers, you'll have one devoted to each team for the hypercar crews, and although you share information about the tyres, they are discreet, so the Lamborghini guys won't know what the Toyota guys are doing in terms of temperatures, pressures, cambers, and so on to get the best out of their tires. You, you have to, the teams have to trust you that their information that they really worked hard to learn is not being passed on to another team. Exactly, it's exactly this. We have a fully dedicated person technician per car manufacturers. Of course, we give to all the, the hypercar the same type of tire recommendation of usage. After, the job of the tire technician is to optimize the performance with each car. So it can be less camber, more pressure, we can go on the, over the limit, but there's a playground for, to, to improve the, the performance on, the, on each car. So, with, with a growing field of hypercars, that means you have to, you have, to have a, a, a more significant presence on the ground because we've got nearly twice as many cars that you have to service as last year. Yes, we need to improve, the, 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 the team is uh, bigger. We need to improve also the way we are working with the team because every team has a different way of working. So we are learning with the new, uh, new car manufacturers. But we had a lot of uh, time last year because uh, there, it was an intensive uh, development uh, phase with them. So uh, now we, we are all uh, looking at uh, this weekend to, to, to work finally on the race. Finally, bef before we get into, into free final free practice, Coming to a new circuit with these cars, now whatever experience Michelin has of this circuit helps, but with these cars it's a brand new track. How important is two days of running in the prologue for, for building that speed up, getting everybody up to speed? Yeah, we were lucky like last year, we came here in testing in the end of November, so it, we are already a big improvement for us to, 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 to came here, I would say, in a, in a more comfortable way because it's a new track. Uh, new surface also. We heard a lot of stories about the tires in this, uh, this race track, so for us we were a bit uh, nervous on that. So we were, be, uh, we were reassured uh, after the test in November. We confirmed it during the prologue, now with all the cars, and the, 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 the two days of prologue have been very, very useful. And now we, uh, we have a better idea of the tire life on this, uh, this race track. We saw, last, we saw last year for the first time, and thank you for that, this introduction of something the fans can actually see what's going on with the tyres. With this colour-coded uh, uh, bars on the side of the, 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 the rubber for uh, identification of which of the compounds we've got, you're enhancing that for this year, so it's going to be even easier to see that, I gather. Yeah. Sorry for this uh, race event, so we were not ready to provide the full, uh, definite uh, colours on the sidewalk, so we will improve the, a little bit the visibility compared to last year, but from Imola, it will be easier when you see the car running on the track, you will be able to see which specs they will use because we'll have a big uh, color uh, signage on the sidewall, so it will be a lot, lot easier to, to, to so so little identify. A little less pressure on our pit reporters. With exactly. Pressure, so that's absolutely fine. Brilliant stuff. And it is another part, uh, Martin, isn't it, of these efforts to open up the sport and the detail of this sport that people just seem to lap up. The more we give them, the more they want. That's what we want. We, uh, our job is to make people love this the way that we do, and uh, with our partners, uh, we get the opportunity to try and do that, try to explain more. So, listen, wish you all at Misha a, a great season, and uh, yeah, going to be very interesting to see who gets the best out of their tyres. Obviously, on a track like this, with the with the warmth of the tarmac, preheating the tyres is less of a worry, and going out on cold tyres less of a worry. But uh, 
Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Porsche at the top of the times at the moment. The uh, number five Penske Porsche set the fastest time so far. Mark, Matt Campbell was in the car now in the pit lane. Stoffel van Dorn, one of our new driver lineups in the Peugeot, second quickest as the Cadillac pops to the top of the tree. Again, looking down there, there is the number five Penske Porsche. Uh, the Penske Motorsport team now based in Germany with this crew, and they and Jota and Proton seem to have a little bit more of a handle on the Porsche. And uh, it, it, it would have been a surprise, and Davidson, if a, if a manufacturer with a sports car racing history as significant as Porsches was not making progress with their cars. We talked to them last year, towards the end of the season, they had a list of jobs that they were going to do uh, for this year, and it looks like that list of jobs has, has worked pretty well. Yeah, naturally, in, uh, in second season for many of these manufacturers, you'd expect to see some progression. And um, so we're seeing that mostly with the, with the Porsche team, actually, and all of the customer teams that run their, their car, their platform. I think one of the biggest areas they've improved is in the braking. Uh, remember, you can't improve the car aerodynamically unless you're using up a few of your jokers, which the teams all have. Yep. But within a five-year period, you don't want to be in, in static set of regulations. You don't want to be using those up too quickly. But in terms of safety and, uh, yeah, systems, you can improve things race by race if you wish and that's one thing that Porsche have, have really locked onto is that weakness in the car they saw last year and that's in turn helping with the customer teams. Looking at some of our GT3 contenders we just saw a familiar shape Porsche 911. Here's an unfamiliar shape, unless you're a fan of Japanese GT racing. The Lexus, one of the, in fact, the oldest homologated car on the grid, homologated back in 2015. So venerable is, is the word we're looking for there, but with the team bringing their toe in the water. And Anthony, the arrival of new manufacturers, new teams has brought some well-known new drivers. Now, Valentino Rossi has raced here before, but that was on significantly fewer wheels than we hope his BMW will have through the course. And Valentino raced at Le Mans last year in the Road to Le Mans support races. They were very close to winning the first, got caught out by a safety car, won the second one. And this is the car he shares, or has shared, predominantly with Maxime Martin in GT World Challenge Europe, where they have also been race winners. Now coming up to the World Endurance Championship stage, and he just seems to be lapping it all up. He's loving life. He's I absolutely mean. loving it. Yeah, speaking to the drivers that share the car with him and the, the sister car crew as well, they're saying that he's adapted to this car very quickly. He's uh, an incredibly humble person as well, and he's there to learn. And, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's always asking questions. He, he hasn't arrived here as, you know, I am the big I am, Valentino Rossi, you must do what I say as we see a car off there, the McLaren number 59. I don't know which corner that is right now. Bonte, uh, the, the yellow. Well, that's a six. It's James so Cottingham. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The course is a red flag for the runner-up in the last year's British GT Championship, James Cottingham, experienced GT3 racer. So whether or not we get a chance is this, oh, way over the, yeah. Yeah, we've seen a lot of that so far. The, the gravel traps are there to do their job. As we were just talking about Valentino Rossi and this predominantly being a motorbike circuit, so you do have lots of runoff, but also you have quite a bit of gravel within that runoff. And uh, that car has got properly beached there, hence the red flag. One of the tricky corners that turn five before turn six, hard one to get right. If you go over those curbs, it's easy to lose the rear end. Sorry, boys, I'm stunned, and I'm in the gravel at the end of turn five. Yeah, copy that. We just saw that. Interestingly, that was much better in uh, in that first of the third gear corners. You were just trying to carry a bit too much speed to get on the power. So first of the third gear corners, that would be turn four. So it's a double right hand, a short straight in between them. So he was better and carried more speed through turn four. And maybe that's it in turn, which made him carry too much speed through turn five, the second right hander. That, that's a classic fix one problem. Yeah. You just move it. But, but it is, isn't it? You carry more speed. And so then you're getting into turn five quicker than you expected to. And, and you haven't got it great. Well, with the storyline there, OK, not the best of storylines for LGT3. 
uh, gives us an opportunity to switch to our other tyre partners and a brand new adventure for Goodyear this season in this amazing LMGT3 class. Six, eight, ten cylinder cars, turbo, non turbo, front, mid, rear engine cars. <laughs> no challenge then, Mike McGregor, in developing the new uh, tyres for the new class. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's a very different challenge. Well, we, apparently we're going to pause because we are going to be going down to pit lane for the very first time. And uh, I think we've got Lou Beckett down. Down to Lou. Hello. Yes, there's lots of changes happening here in 2024 in the WEC. And one of those is also going to be in the pit lane. It's not just with the teams and the drivers, but also your pit lane interviewer. You've known me for many years since 2012 here in the WEC and now I'm introducing Bruce Uani who's also going to be joining us. Bruce is going to share the pit lane with us here this weekend and then you'll see much more of him throughout the season while I step back. Bruce, hello. Hello there. I'm so happy to be joining you guys and uh, yeah, first time for me in the WEC. The grid is absolutely amazing. Uh, I think I'll see you in Le Mans. We'll be together again, which I'm looking forward to. But yeah, guys, I'll be taking you up and down uh, the pit lane during the races and the weather's beautiful now. We're in Qatar and we're going to have a fantastic weekend, so watch. See you then. All right, so Bruce, for those of you who may not know his name, uh, former top flight single seater racer, also one of the stars of Top Gear France, and uh, LMP1 racer yeah. back in the day. Uh, remember and Bruce, my early days in sports car reporting. Lovely, lovely fella. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's fabulous to have him here. We're going to miss Lou. Yes, absolutely. Well, she's still part of the family. She, she, will, is. she will absolutely be back at Le Mans for the 24 hours. And uh, yeah, just taking a little, little more time out uh, to be with her actual family, as opposed to us group of lanky idiots. Let's get back to Mike McGregor, because he was cut <laughs> off in his prime there. Uh, well, but Mike, what a challenge coming to the World Endurance Championship in this very exciting era, not just for the hypercars, but also for LMGT3, a brand new class to World Championship uh, racing, and with more variety at this level than we've ever seen before. And that must be part of the challenge. Yeah, it really was a challenge. I mean, we, we started well before um, the tender process came out to make sure we could be ready for this, but having nine different manufacturers on the grid, all with very different weight distributions, and challenges in terms of all the driving styles, it, it, it's really been a rigorous development programme that we've done over the last 18 months. And, and presumably you didn't know at that stage, because nobody knew exactly what you were getting, you just had to go, well, let's look at some of the extremes, how are we going to deal with that? How much did LMP2 and your knowledge of those cars, those tyres, how much did that inform what you were doing? Or did, the, did, did it come more from a touring car background? Where's, where's all the information coming from? Well, yeah, LMP2 didn't really have an influence at all, to be honest with you. We, we really had to start from scratch. We did use some of our experience with GTE racing in the LMS last year. Yeah. That was kind of our benchmark to get the balance of performance right to ensure that the front engine, mid engine, rear engine combinations all could get the most out of the package. But really, it, it, it's a new tyre ground up, so it's new mould profiles, new compounds and fully new constructions for this year. In terms of uh, testing, real-world testing, you're obviously using circuits, are they mostly in Europe or are you travelling further afield to get into the hotter climbs that we have here, for example, in Qatar, or is most of it done in the rigs back at home? Well, we started off with a lot of simulation testing, but then once we started the track testing, we wanted to make sure that we covered off a lot of the benchmarks. So we actually tested in Kota at the exact same time that we're going to race at this year, and the ambient temperatures were 45 degrees. car is back on track. We are waiting for the car to come back to the pits to resume the session. Well, the first chance here to look at one of our brand new LM GT3 cars, the Ford Mustang GT3 and uh, already has made its global debut in the Rolex 24 hours, of course. But, Mike, this has been one of the challenges because you presume you've not had much time with uh, this big uh, this big banger here. It's an astonishing-looking thing. It really is a kind of good old-fashioned US muscle car. Um, just what challenges does that throw at you? Well, we, we, we've actually tried to include as many of the manufacturers as possible to make sure that we were covering all of that off and a, and a huge quantity of drivers. Um, so. 
uh, the Ford was involved in some of our development and testing, as well as the Corvette and the McLaren, the BMW. We, we've, we've tried to cover off as many benches as possible. We, we started a lot of the testing with Porsche and then Ferrari, um, being the key endurance manufacturers that we've worked with, but we've made sure to introduce them them all somewhere along the way. Let's have a listen to what's going on down at Hertz Team Show. That's Phil Hansen aboard the 38 car right now. Seatbelts are still the same. Can't loosen them. Can you repeat this one? I said the seatbelts are still the same. I can't loosen them. That was Jensen. Yeah, but that Jensen. wasn't Jensen. Uh, right, OK. <laughs> they weren't, that they weren't Jensen. Jensen. That wasn't Jensen's. That wasn't Jensen, was it? I looked like Phil Hansen. I did. It didn't, uh, look, it didn't look like Hansen's eyes. Yeah, but it's, uh, it was Jensen, yeah, definitely Jensen, yeah. but it's an yeah. old, uh, okay. it's probably an old radio message. But we're back to green flag running. Uh, Mike, give us a kind of an idea. You've been around motorsport for an awfully long time and around the endurance family for a long time. The level, financial terms, but just in terms of resource and time that's gone into making this the best it possibly can be with such a wide array of machinery. It, it, it's really impressive. I have to say, I mean, I, I have been around a while. Don't make me sound too old, Graham. But <laughs> yeah, 23, 24 tops. <laughs> um, but Seasons. yeah, I, I mean, really, we were shocked when we turned up here at, at how high the level is. You know, it, it's really stepped up again. I, I didn't think after last year, WEC could take such another big step, but it, it really has. And we're so excited to start this season. I think the other big change we've got for GT3 for us this year is we've got more than one specification. So you're going to see some variations at different tracks of which tyre we bring. And I think it's going to play a lot into the strategy on certain cars being able to exploit differences. I think in the race here, you're going to see some very interesting strategies, not trying to give too much away before the start of the race. And the other big thing we've got for this year is the Wingfoot Award is now here for GT3. Talk to us about that, because that's something that will come, I think, much more to the fore because these cars are going to get a lot more uh, airtime because we've got, we're down now to those two classes. Tell us about the Wingfoot Award, what that's all about. So we introduced it for LMP2, and it's about trying to reward the drivers specifically that have the best, most consistent performance. And obviously it's the essence of endurance that we're looking at consistency. And the focus for this year is to give all the drivers the opportunity to win that. So we'll be at every race doing an evaluation throughout the race. The point score system is based the same as it is for the overall championship point score system. And it then gives the drivers to a chance to win this award after each race. Fabulous. We'll be giving that a little bit of air time as well. For now, Mike, we're going to let you go and get back to, I presume, uh, applying the whip to the Goodyear Tire Engineers up and down the pit lane. It is great to have you guys back. It's great to be part of, you see Larry Holt there in the, uh, the beanie, and that's uh, Ryan Hardwick in the baseball cap, ready to go in the Mustang. It's great to have such strong partners here with you guys from Goodyear, with Michelin, with Total Energies, with all the other array of talent it takes to put something together at this level. And what made this continue? Yeah, we're really excited for another amazing season. Great stuff. Thanks, Mike. Well, back on track, gentlemen. Uh, times are coming down into the 140s now for Cadillac Racing's number two and for the number five Porsche Penske Motorsports uh, 963. Well, here's the Mustang coming back in. We were just taking a look at that a moment or two ago. One of our... One of our so many brand new cars. Now, some of the cars, some of the teams are identically liveried. Here's the car that is currently slowest, but also possibly sexiest in the hypercar. The SC63. This is Lamborghini's first hypercar. It's a good area Corsa. 63 is the demarcation. The 63, because that was the year in which Ferruccio Lamborghini started it's the company. It's not just Lamborghini's first ever hypercar. It's Lamborghini's first ever top class sports car. There have been Lamborghini engine sports cars before, yes, but never has there been a Lamborghini factory car in the top class. Fabulous stuff. Another yeah. headline. That was Danny Fiat at the wheel of that car. And, uh, he moves up from the LMP2 category that he drove in last season. And uh, yeah, exciting times for, for all the drivers that have moved up from the, uh, the P2 or, or even the GT category. Obviously, it was GTE last year, now GT3 platform. Uh, so yeah, we waved. Goodbye to the GTE platform at the end of last year. 
And yeah, for Danny Fiat, it's an exciting time for him in the Lamborghini number 63 car. A little bit of a lock up there though into turn six. It's quite easy to happen with the, uh, the unloaded tire as you turn into the tightest corner on the track. I still wouldn't say it's a very slow speed corner, but it's the slowest one we have here. Yeah. Uh, good long shots of both of the Mustangs, the number 77 car. And I'm going to have to get used to this being the 77. Yes. Uh, because the car the car colours on the 88 were last year's colours on the 77. So it's a turquoise, yes. But we also got a shot, of course, of Christian Reed, who yep. until Bahrain was Mr. Ever present, he's now not going to be that. But he's still present. He's, he's still just present, not driving just not the cars driving. any longer. Yeah. Uh, but impressive stuff from Broton here and around the world this season with more and more efforts in more and more series and again, and classes. Uh, over so many years, Proton, Dempsey Proton, has been followed by the word Porsche. So that's another one that we're going to have to get ourselves out of the, the learned it by rote habit of saying it is no longer Proton competition Porsche, it is Proton competition Ford Mustang. So, yeah, it, a, a big, big change. Now, Christian and Gerald Reed uh, 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 were were Porsche racers long before they were running cars. I'm sure that family link will still continue. Right, so let's catch up with Ferdy Habsburg. The target of this stint is to follow Leaf Pip and CLM, to follow Energy, and then to set up well the car regarding the car balance. Yeah, an interesting message there to Ferdinand Habsburg, another driver that steps up from LMP2 into the top category hypercar for this season. In the Alpine, it's a great opportunity uh, for Ferdinand Habsburg to really show what he's made of. He had put in some stellar performances last year, and I'm excited. He's one of the drivers I'm excited to see in hypercar. And just getting some information there from the engineer, something that's very different to LMP2, the energy management of these hypercars but also focus on a good programme in terms of setup. Yeah, live from the pit lane, you might have seen the red flag which was caused by, by car number 59. And, and uh, uh, just here we're working out to put the car back. Actually, there's not so much gravels on the car, uh, in the car, sorry, but the tyres have been damaged, so we're actually changing damage over there. If you, I don't know if you can come with me, you can see some nice flat spots on the tyres there that won't be used again. Sorry, you're a bit far, but yeah. New tires and a change of driver. And now it's uh, Costa, who's just jumped back into car 59, ready to go and join back the track. That's Nico Costa, who's the reigning Brazilian uh, Porsche Coro Cup champion. A Ray, as we said, of new, new drivers here. I think I might, it's 26 full rookies yeah. this year, yeah. plus three drivers that have done Le Mans only yeah. once. Yeah. So almost 30 of the drivers in this race. So here's the particular point, well, that's a, a talking point, quite aside from the new talent, it's a lot to learn. Yeah, plus, we're just seeing that replay of uh, James Cottingham overcooking it in turn five. But we've got drivers who are very experienced in completely different cars, and in some cases, in completely different categories. Talking of very experienced, Brendan Hartley is under investigation in the number eight Toyota for crossing the pit entry white line, i.e. coming in late. Well, let's hear now from uh, Isotta Fraschini for the very first time. Okay, tyre seems to be ready. Start working on your driving now. Remember, push on the braking. Let's try to gently delay your braking phase. That's Antonio Cervale, who's uh, come to this team via Indy Lights uh, last season. Got the call. Uh, because he drove with a team at uh, the Rolex 24 last season, which was crewed by Duquesne team. Uh, and Duquesne team are the service provider for Isotto Fraschini, yeah. with the Michelotto crew here as well in engineering support for this brand new concept, bespoke LMH rules car for the Italian make, which rolls beneath our, uh, our, uh, our window as I say that. A quick shot there of, I think, one of the heroes of this era, uh, Philippe Signor from Signatech. Uh, this, getting the Alpine project to this point, a huge amount of the credit goes to him and the people he's gathered around him. Uh, a full factory effort with a full 21st century hypercar effort. Yeah, you fade there. In the, of course, a garage looking on as the beautiful number 83 car in the hands of Robert Kibitza now. Um, I really do think that's a, a very strong lineup with uh, Yi Yifei, who has been incredibly fast. In, again, in LMP2, he's another driver that steps up into hypercar this season. An incredibly quick driver. He's learned a lot at Jota last season. 
and that will serve him well coming into this this year. He has shared the car before with Robert Kubica, one of his teammates for this season, but also Robert Schwartzman. Uh, he's raced in F2 before uh, and incredibly quick. I think this driver lineup is very exciting. And maybe not many people in the world of sports cars necessarily know much about Robert Schwartzman, but I'm excited to see these three together. He tested, of course, at the rookie test at Bahrain. All three of these guys were testing the car um, at Yas Marina the days before we went into the final weekend of the Asia Le Mans series. So we had He's filling in his driver debrief sheet. Go, absolutely. <laughs> so we had two days to actually observe them in this car. He doesn't <laughs> want us to <laughs> let go. <laughs> Just cottoned on to the back. Why didn't we zoom in on that? <laughs> um, but it, it is exciting. It's exciting to see in particular, Anthony, how they're going to progress through the season. They have got ground to make up. There are no walls in terms of the data being shared with the factory team is what we understand and you know realistically here it's a brand new asset for ferrari in this championship to learn more well apart from setting up the car in terms of your mechanical balance the ride heights all of those usual things that you do to a car over the course of a weekend there's nothing else you can do because the car is homologated that way it's not like formula one for people new to the world of endurance racing it's not like Formula where you're going to see upgrades in terms of aerodynamics or, or power unit advancements coming at the cars thick and fast every single race or even year to year. That doesn't happen in this category. In a way, it's a bit like a cost cap yep. by locking in that performance, the design of your car for five years and relying on the balance of performance within those four windows of the power, the drag, uh, the weight and the downforce of the car. So once you hit the criteria of all four of those elements of, of, uh, of production in a way, that's how the BOP, the balance of performance, is taken care of. So very, very different concept to one. They physically have a cost cap, how much they, they can spend the year, but that's not the case in, in the world of endurance racing. It's done in a different way yeah. by locking in that homologation for five years in, in a row. You can have a joker where, like Peugeot, they're going to use one of their jokers to, like you said at the start of the show, Graham, they're going to use that joker to change the platform of their car. But that's one big joker gone in yep. the course of five years. So they, they very much have to get it right this time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, there's just some different uh, nuances between different championships. Now, you're watching us now on the FIA WC YouTube channel. Uh, don't forget that you'll be able to watch all the race action on Saturday and qualifying this afternoon, Saturday, uh, on the FIA WC app. If you haven't downloaded it, you probably ought to think about that forthwith. And you can also take the opportunity to catch up a little bit with some of the names and faces um, from last season with our full access programs, which are all on YouTube and available to watch at any time. Give you a great fly on the wall. Uh, it, it's not a... It's not a drive to survive confection, if you like, but it does give you a very, very good idea of some of the tensions and pressures within the teams and some of the fun and enjoyment within the teams that, it, that are involved in, in, in sports car racing and endurance racing. So you'll be able to see all of those episodes, including uh, the Christmas specials and the, and the uncut versions. So lots and lots of content. If you're new to this, if you've arrived from somewhere following a driver or following a team or following a manufacturer, then, boy, have we got a lot coming for you. And that, that full access series will continue this season as well. Heartily recommend the Christmas special because uh, what the guys did there was to bring reaction from the people involved in some of the emotion of the season into a brand new programme. And if you, if you love that kind of human drama, that's a great, I think it's an hour and a half long, yep. uh, that's a great watch. Uh, if you've got that opportunity to do so this weekend or beyond that. I just had a quick look there at the number 54 car on pit lane. That's the new look in terms of both the car, the team name and the livery mm. for AF Corsa. Now Vista AF Corsa with tribute to Vista Jet, their new sponsor. Yeah. And well, top of the times at the moment, LMG3. And they were fastest yesterday in free practice too. In fact, their two Ferraris were first and second. But it's sort of different because we've had that, that red and silver livery on the 54 car with Thomas Floor in it. Um, almost since time immemorial, but, but that it's now a two-car setup with identical cars. And here you can see one of the two Porsches, both run by Manti Racing. Now, Manti Racing have been the 
Quasi Works Factory Le Mans team of choice in the GT, GT category for decades. Olaf Mantai with his fabulously elaborate beard and moustache yet was, uh, was the father of the team. Here is the pure racing car. You just saw the other uh, one, which is the AME car. EMA. EMA, sorry. Yep. Um, so they're both Mante. Yes. Both run by Mante. Yeah, that's the complication. So yep. they're both Mante. They look completely different, but one's 91, one's 92. Well, the same so with they the are... Proton Fords. Exactly. They're running the same garage by the same team. And think back to last year, the D-Station Aston Martin was one of a couple run by TF Sport, but in different colours. Now, TF Sport aren't running the Astons this year. So TF Sport Aston Martin throughout history. No, it's now TF Sport Corvette. So we have to get used to that as well. Lots of familiar teams with other familiar cars. We've already <laughs> yes. seen the United Auto Sport McLaren, a fabulous effort that is there. D Station now run with AMR Pro Drive with this car, the 777 car, with a brand new driver line up there. The Monzai effort and that pure racing car. And there's the stories galore to tell there a brand new flag to the FI World Endurance mm. Championship because that's a team from Lithuania and there's a heck of a backstory there yeah. which we're digging into through the season. Well look here so we've got AF Corsa running two Ferraris and Vista Jet liveries, great Iron Lynx and the Iron Dames same team as before so we've got Iron Lynx two years ago with Porsches the, what two years ago was Ferrari? Uh, two years ago with Ferrari, last year with Porsche, this year with Lamborghini because they didn't want to run a clashing Italian manufacturer while they were working on their Lamborghini development program. So Lamborghini GT3 cars run by Iron Lynx and Iron Dames. Heart of Racing and D-Station, as last year, same colours on Aston Martin. So you know, you see the colour and you automatically go, that's an Aston. Yes, it still is. Just run by a different team, that by run by Pro Drive, by Aston Martin Racing. Then fifth and sixth on the timing screens, the two United Auto Sports McLarens. Now they are a combination of McLaren's papaya orange and the black on the 95 winning, 1995 Le Mans winning Ueno Clinic McLaren F1 GTR. Um, JJ later and the crew, it's okay. What's not the coming to me? What's the bloke? Who is the third? He's been driving one of our pretty Porsches later. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, Yannick. <laughs> Yannick Dama, so it was. So it was, of course. <laughs> and then, so you've got the two United Autosport McLarens. You've got TF Sport running a pair of Corvettes, one of which is black with a yellow band across the middle. The other one is yellow with a black band across the middle. You've got uh, the two Team WRT BMWs, Valentino Rossi um, uh, in the 46 car you just saw. Uh, that's out, who's out on that? I think it's Max, isn't it? Uh, Max Martin. Um, and then Acodis. We haven't talked about Acodis AS ASP, which is Jerome Polycon's team. They did a free shot of one of the McLarens. Here we are. And that was the, Al Harty in, yeah. the, uh, in the, in the uh, 46 BMW, by the way. Okay. So, yeah, so there's a new change. So, Maxi Martin and, and uh, Valentino Rossi joined by Al Harty, who's been an Aston Martin GT driver, who has also been racing in LMS in LMP2. Angel of is LMP2. Uh, and sorry, setting LMP2. pole positions yeah. in LMP2 cars. I, I, uh, I just, you know, so stuff. many changes. A, so moment, many a moment to talk about uh, Akonis ASP. And we've, we've already seen one of the very handsome looking Lexus uh, on track as the yellow Ferrari passes the yellow fronted uh, Corvette yeah. that rumbles by. One of those two brand new teams to the FI World Insurance Championship. There are aspects of other teams that have been with us. Uh, it's Otto Fraschini with Duquesne team, brand new in hypercar. Yep. Codis ASP, Autosport Promotion, uh, Jerome Ponicon's team, brand new in LM GT3, switching to make the, the jump into the FI World Jones Championship to Lexus in an absolutely blinding uh, political move for them. Yeah. And boy, have they got a driver line up to bring to this fight. Well, they have. I mean, among the drivers in the GT3 Lexus, Sorry, is sorry, Martin, that was a late call, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, just yeah. for Al Harty. You saw him cross the white line as well. We saw that message pop yeah, up yeah. before for one of the Toyota drivers, Brendan Hartley. So I think if, uh, unfortunately for him, that was directly caught on camera. So I, I should imagine we're going to see that same message pop up for Al Harty. We've seen, yeah. we've seen the doctor ready to climb aboard. I think that might, has he been in so far? I don't think he has. I don't think we've seen not sure he has, not sure he has. So we're about to see him because there he is uh, at the garage door and about and to climb aboard the car. And that's why he was waiting there with the helmet on because you plug yourself into the radio so you can listen to what the driver's saying as they're driving round. And then when it's ready, time, it could be a late call like I think it was, the doctor jumps well, into action. Exactly as on his leathers, young man. 
what, what, whatever your knowledge of motorcycle racing may or may not be, everybody knows Valentino Rossi in the same way that everybody knows Nigel Mansell, you know, Lewis Hamilton and, and so on, whether they follow Formula One or not. He's, he's, he's one of the world's legendary sports he's an icon. figures. I mean, he's he an icon. Is. He, he, th that's a word that's massively yeah. overused. He's an icon. And better still, what a fabulous bloke. Yeah, one, one of the nicest, funniest guys you'll meet. Well, now... Why was he running around? This is only free practice. What's all that about? Well, everything, it, it is that, that word, practice. In the race, you can lose time in a pit stop that you never can win back on track. That's what it's about. Their pit stop, even in free practice, is absolutely a dress rehearsal for a race pit stop. And so it's getting into the habit of all the different regulations in this championship compared to what he was used to last year, getting into the car, getting the belts tightened up, all these driver interchanges that y you can spend ages trying to do it if you haven't rehearsed it in the pit lane. Dry, I know you'll see it everywhere. Teams will be out on the pit lane, particularly with the prototypes because they're so hard, much harder to get into. Just rehearsing the driver change, rehearsing the driver change, rehearsing the driver change. And some nice little details here, like on your road car, lockable steering column. It's adjustable for reach and for height, so you can have it exactly where you want in it. In terms of safety, the FIA like the drivers to sit in exactly the same position or yes. as close to as possible for headrest, restraint, and all, all that kind of safety. So the netting, which covers mm -hmm. the driver's eyes, that's all there for safety. So if you can move the controls to the driver or away from the driver yeah. and all sit in the same position, place in that safety cell of the car that's what it's all about and, and that will be the same thing with the pedals as well you Absolutely. move the pedals forward and actually never mind what the fia want the engineers want the weight in the same place because that's what the car's designed around so you don't want the weight of the driver 60 70 80 90 100 kilos moving forwards or backwards in the car because it changes the balance so we've got uh, alex lynn on the screen there on the right hand side so he's uh, part of the cadillac racing crew in the car number two Shares that with Earl Bamba and Sebastian Bourdais for this weekend. Car looking very sharp, top of the time sheets at the moment from Penske Porsche, from Hurst in Jota Porsche, from Penske Porsche, and the Peugeot's again looking strong here. Now, this is a car that was designed for one job, and that was not to race in the World Endurance Championship, that was to win Le Mans. So it has been designed specifically around what Le Mans is, which is long, open, flat, fast. And so a more high-speed, flat, open track like this, in theory, than, let's say, Spa-Francorchamps, should suit the Peugeot better. It should be closer to its window. Actually, that seems to be what's going on with it. Fifth quickest at the moment for the fastest uh, two non-X8s. Uh, but one other quick point, we saw the in-car shot of Valentino Rossi. The race on Saturday will go very much into darkness under the floodlights here. Cars look amazing. The in-car camera quality we've seen in the broadcasts, we're, test broadcasts we've done so far, is astonishing. If you are going to be watching it with one of our broadcast partners or on the WC app, you'll get that treat. Beyond that, though, there is something else that is back for this season. If you're away from home, but on a mobile device, you can still tune in uh, free of charge through the website or through the app and hear us for every session that we're on air watching us on YouTube at the moment. That same sound feed is available uh, through the timing screens on a little icon, I believe, at the top there, and you should be able to hear the dulcet tones yep. of Mr. Haven, Mr. So, Davidson. So if you Mr. need to go shopping or mow the lawn or whatever else, no, you can do no so with, to us, miss any with of us in your ears. Let's catch up it with the pit lane with Bruce Duane. Now, Bruce, we were just talking about Peugeot and how the car seems to be a lot closer to the pace now. What are the team telling you? Well, I just had a chit chat uh, there and uh, they were very early on on the pace and that's because they did their quality run right at the beginning of the session. So they used brand new tires um, with black fuel and that's why they were, they seem very competitive. Actually, they've been competitive so far, but at the moment they know that it will, they will not improve their lap time. Thank you very much. Now, the, the, the beer mentioned the word quality. Oh, right, thank you very much for that cue because that was one of the things I knew we had to talk about. Qualifying is different, Anthony Davidson, and and that's good. That's we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's catch up with the number eight Toyota team. See what they've got to say for themselves down towards the end of the timing screens. Okay, do you have tire two, tire two, radio check. Tire two. Okay, info from Seb is to sacrifice entry for exit in high speed as to not overload front tires. I would also suggest going softer on front anti-roll bar. 
Yeah, it's an interesting radio message that apparently a, a, a few weeks ago they had a test here. Uh, not so much the Toyota team, but they ex the teams that did test here on a quite a green circuit, so I mean the dusty track by that, before the rubber starts to go down. They're all experiencing quite a lot of front tire graining. So that message really ties up to Rio Hirakawa there in the car number eight, Toyota. There's a lot more pressure going through the front tires, a lot more slip going through the front tires, causing that graining. Is that a bit of a moment there in some of the high-speed corners? You have to be patient when you're in the, the hypercar. There's nothing you can do as you get uh, caught up behind them. That's where the hypercar is going to have more downforce than the GT3 cars, and patience is key. Yeah, there are some sections, and, and from corner six, the hairpin, through to basically corner exit at corner 10, that is a one-line racetrack you cannot pass, and that's where Andre Lotter got caught. Very uh, Italianate gesture from Andre Lotter there to Going the back poor to driver in the Alpha, uh, in the uh, Lamborghini. Just to close off on that tire graining problem and what Rio Hirakawa, is, the message has come from Sebastian Buemi, the driver before him, uh, was saying, look, if you can just ease off and carry less speed into the corner, particularly those medium speed corners, ease out of it, get the car turned while you're not slipping the front tyre, get the car rotated and get a straighter exit, it will definitely help mitigate the understeer, which then in turn uh, helps to overload the front tyres. And also, I'd suggest a softer anti-roll bar. Now, in my head, that would mean to steer because you're leaning more on the outside tyre but actually I think what you're saying there is in combination with not loading up the front tyre so much when you're in the initial part of the turn you actually keep keep a better balance it basically between means the tyres. If you're carrying too much speed into a medium speed corner you end up trying to slow the car down by just cranking your steering angle into it. Yeah. That gives you overheating of the front tyres and you lose performance. In worst case you start to break the tyres. Yeah. So what he's saying is do that on the brakes or lift off earlier and lift and coast into the corner. Not so much the slow speed corner like this one we're looking at there, but it's more on those medium speeds where you can really start to damage the front tyres if you just try and control it with the steering instead of the brakes or throttle. Let's talk briefly, Graham, about qualifying. That's our next track session. That's the final one before the race. That is, well, we'll be on air just before 4 o'clock local. So 15.50 local, which is 12.50 GMT. You can do the time conversions to yeah. your own time zones. Radically different this season. A hyper Cup poll comes to the rest of the World Endurance Championship. It will be for both classes. Yep. It will be 12 minutes of qualifying followed by 10 minutes of hyper pole for the top 10 qualifiers only. Exactly so, and so two things have happened. First of all, we, we still will qualify by category. So last year we had three qualifying periods, one for GTE, one for LMP2, one for hypercar. This year we will have two periods, one for GT3, one for hypercar, but they'll be much shorter. I mean, almost half the length. Last year was 20 minutes, this year is going to be 12. So this is... Uh, obviously, at Le Mans, it will be a, a great deal of time because it's a much longer lap. 12 minutes will give you one flying lap if you're really lucky at Le Mans. But here, it's really, you have to get onto it. In the GT class, as previously, the bronze-rated driver, so the gentleman driver you've liked, in this case, Takeshi Kimura in the, uh, the Akonis ASP, he will be the or she will be the it will be the bronze racing driver that does the qualifying so it'll be peer against peer you're not in against an xf1 driver or jose maria lopez or whatever you're in against a similar uh, level of, of driver so that's one of the factors in hypercar throw whoever you got in it well, whoever it seems to be the quickest or whoever's turn it is get them in get it done yeah, and a couple of things to say uh, about that. One is the pressure is going to be there. Remember, no tyre warming in the FI World Insurance Championship. Yep. You've got to get the heat into the tyres in a 12-minute session to get into the top 10 to a chance of that pole position. And whilst you're quite right, it is the non-professional driver that will qualify the cars. What we've seen in that situation is their progression through the session. So the action is right until the flag without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, also, if you've been watching live timings available through FIWC.com and of course on the app, what you'll have been seeing there is some of the bronze drivers pretty high up in the order. That's because they've been running qualifying sims during the prologue and the free practice sessions. Yeah, yeah. So they're already being uh, tried out there on new rubber and on low fuel load. So seeing just exactly how quickly they can extract 
the maximum performance out of the package they've got underneath them. I think it's going to be a very exciting show. I think it is. Uh, there's there's a, a, such a mix in both classes, such a mix of experience in teams that have been here before with different cars or teams that have been here before with the same cars. Drivers who have had a little bit of experience. Uh, uh, <laughs> chat there from, from Surrey, uh, has driven at the old car. But, but in, in all seriousness, Jensen, race of the month last year in the NASCAR, okay? Very different from what he's doing now in Hertz Team Jojo and Mighty 38. Did race in LMP1 with SMP. So, Anthony, as a driver, he obviously has not lost the passion. He's not lost the speed, clearly. Is he going to be a good fit in a team like Jota? Is that going to really... Is he going to feel the love there? And really, is that going to bring him out? Well, I spoke to him yesterday, actually. He's, he's so impressed with the team. And uh, I'm, I'm glad he is, because I spent my time at Toyota at, at Jota as well. And they're such a professional outfit, and that's what Jensen's enjoying now. Let's hear from Nick Nielsen. OK, mate, in terms of pace, we're happy with sector one and two on that lap. Two laps ago, there was a track limit T15. Pace is on target, we like There is something on set on this steering wheel, I guess. It's not the EPS. Copy, we'll check after the session. If it looks safe to you, we carry on, four laps to go. This is safe, but the problem is we have a lot of monsters here because it's also not consistent. Struggling with the consistency of the feel of the steering wheel there. He said the EPS, the electronic power steering system, uh, I don't, he, he didn't feel that was to blame, but there's some inconsistencies there, which is, which is kind of telling him lies in many ways and, and, and giving them wrong information, making him believe there's understeer when there shouldn't be or vice versa. So. Yeah. It, you need a consistent uh, feel, feedback coming through the steering wheel. It's one of your vital cues as to what that the front of the car is doing and also the rear of the car with uh, kicks of oversteer that come through the rear as well. When, so, when all of these things are electrically assisted, throttle by wire, brake by wire, power steer, electric power steering rather than a more constant hydraulic power steering, if, if, if they suffer fluctuations, then really, you, you know, on your road car, if you turn the wheel a certain amount, you expect it to turn a certain amount, whether it's got power steering or not. But, uh, and, and racing cars, until really high downforce came in, would never have had assistance because you want that intimate feel for what the front is doing. Like in a motorcycle, if you lose the front, you've lost the car. So you need to have that feel. And, and if it's, yeah, telling you lies, if it's, if it's, either over-assisting, so or it feels like an XJ6, or under-assisting, so you're having to wrestle it more, then either way, either way, if it's doing one or the other, you'll get used to it. If it's fluctuating between the two, then you've got The problem is, if it's pressing to it's over-delivering its assistance, it feels like as a cue to the driver, you interpret that as under the the front tire starts to slip, Generally, the load goes through away from the tyre because it's not gripping anymore. It's sliding across the surface. The steering gets lighter. And if the, in, 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 in the flip side of that, if it goes heavier, it usually means that the car's about to oversteer. Wow, look, practicing cleaning the screen <laughs> in the garage. Yep. Nicely done. I guess you can do what you want with that car now because uh, it's, it's, you're not going to be using it next time around. So yeah, do your worst. But yeah, going back to the to the load of the steering. As the load of the steering come strengthens. You interpret that as more grip through the front axle as you get heavier steering. You put yeah. new tyres on the car, the steering becomes heavier. That's how one of your cues as a driver, how you realise that you're on a higher grip situation. But also when you're about to get oversteer, the steering strengthens as well, becomes heavier in your hand. So just to give you an idea of what you're looking for from inside the car. And if, if you're getting the opposite of what you're expecting, it's a nightmare. Well, imagine it in road car terms. If you're driving on a wintry day and it's like cold and frosty and your power steering suddenly overpowers or, or sort of over makes the steering overly easy, you start turning in a wheel and oh, 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 and suddenly you think, I'm on ice. You're not, but it becomes so much easier to turn the wheel that you think something must be wrong. And, and that's it, you know, Drivers like me just hit the middle pedal and go straight off into the hedge, or don't if it isn't icy. Um, but yeah, the, the drivers, 
they are on so much more of a razor edge here. They absolutely need that feeling. Final five minutes of the session, and Graham, Cadillac, Porsche, still at the top of the pile. Yeah, Cadillac, uh, the, the sound of that thing, absolutely amazing still. We're getting complaints about the noise from Saudi Arabia, <laughs> I gather. Seb Bourdais at the wheel of the car at the moment. That tops the times, the caddy, the 140.687. Uh, the number five Porsche, the Penske car, still uh, uh, second fastest ahead of the first of the two Jota cars, the second Penske car, and the first LMH cars. The 94 car is the Peugeot. In GT, it is the heart of racing. Aston Martin Max Repair is putting in 154.964, the only lap under 155. Head of both of the Vista F Corsa cars, up to an early time from Davide Rigon in the 54, head of the sister 55 car. Then the number 60 car, Frank Pereira, putting in a time in the bright yellow Lamborghini. And it's the second of the Aston Martins, finishes out the top five for D-Station Racing. And the highest placed of the new teams for this season uh, are the pair of Alpine cars. You just saw the Alpine garage. To say that it's quite French would be a slight understatement. The only non-French speaker or non-native French speaker, speaker would be Mick Schumacher in their driver lineup. Uh, everybody else uh, is a... Uh is a res resolute francophone but they are 12th and 13th uh, ahead of the pair of bmws and uh, then the lamborghini um the number eight toyota which appears to be hiding its light slightly under a bushel um and then the isorta so the the second hertz team joe to the 38 car actually they looks like they haven't done any kind of quality sim just yet um, maybe they again are confident with what they learned in the first and second free practice sessions and of course in the two track day, days of track sessions in the prologue on Monday and Tuesday. Great to see Mick Schumacher out there and joining the World Endurance Championship welcome Mick Schumacher uh, driving for Alpine there you can see on screen in the car number 36 and uh, yeah, as you say Martin is up there in uh, well, P12 just ahead of Charles Malaisi who's uh, no slouch in these cars, is Charles. So yeah, it's great to see Mick here. You often see him swanning around the paddocks in his Mercedes uh, AMG T-shirt as he's part of the the F1 uh, lineup. He's a development driver, reserve driver for the team. But you need to be racing at the same point as well. So it's great to see drivers not just taking to that role in the paddock, in the world of Formula One. It's brilliant to see him here still holding the steering wheel because that's what you need to do. Well, just to keep him sharp for the team, but also he's creating a, a future for himself. His dad started in sports car racing, went from F3 to the Mercedes junior team, yeah. then moved on into Formula One. But Schumacher possibly doing it the other way around, coming from Formula One and starting to create a career in sports cars. Seb, if you want, there's a seven second gap behind. Yep, copy. Car's pretty good. That both pace and energy are really good. Keep going. Seven second gap behind, which means that he can uh, gird his loins and have a bit of a fling or wang it, as the Aussie would say. On the, uh, That is wang it. He is absolutely wanging it. The car is looking so good. Yes. It, it looks like a better car than it was last year. I don't know what they've worked on in terms of setup over the winter, but they've come here to Qatar at the La Salle circuit, and he's, the car really looks like it's in the right window tell that Seb's enjoying driving the car because he's very quick to criticize if not uh, if he's not happy with the car he will definitely be giving encouraging criticism to the team should we put it that way to make sure that you can get the car in the best possible light and the team is saying yeah and also energy is looking great yep. doing a brilliant job there that's one of the that's one of the things that Seb's so good at doing from all of his IndyCar experiences fuel management and, and that will then translate into energy management with the hybrid systems in these cars as well by using the same tricks of lift and coast before corners. This is a perfect kind of track for Sebastian. Front limited in many areas. The car looks like it's, it's dialed in that way as well. Mm. And uh, yeah, I've been teammates with Seb in the past in the Peugeot era uh, when, I, when I drove an LMP1 with him. And, and I've never met a driver or driven with a driver that can handle such a high amount of understeer is uh, it's like when you were saying earlier on there are tricks to being able to deal with a lot of understeer and uh, this Seb Bourdais is, uh, is is one of the masters of that final seconds of qualifying thanks so much for joining us from around the world literally from around the world I've been looking at the stream and the chat on YouTube 
and spotted that we've got uh, viewers from every continent on the planet with the possible exception of Antarctica. Possible. And, and someone's going to tell me I'm wrong there too. <laughs> so, do, yeah. uh, do you know what? I would love, I would just love us to get a message from somebody in a research station in Antarctica going, it's the height of summer, it's only minus 12, and I'm loving <laughs> the start of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Why wouldn't you be? Yeah. Okay, so... First, final free practice session, uh, not qualifying, uh, finishes with the chequered flag out as uh, the first car across the line, Andre Lotter in a Peugeot, that car fourth fastest at the moment, and the first, what are we looking at, nine cars within a second of the fastest lap of the caddy in GT3, Heart of Racing's Aston Martin ahead of the two Vista AF Corsa Ferraris, and both of those have looked very quick all the way through and again very tight field and that's what balance of performance does everybody bad mouths balance of performance without balance of performance you get formula one and for all it's good and it's bad the only balance is effectively how much money you're allowed to spend based on your previous results but you do often get and we've seen it for so many years one car that hits the sweet spot often Adrian Lewis, and it then dominates. And the whole point of balance of performance is one, to stop the financial arms war, predominantly to make GT3 effective, to make hypercar effective and efficient and affordable. And secondly, to make the racing close. And there's one thing we learned from last year, the racing is close. Take a look at the 24 hours of Le Mans. Take a look at how tight it was between Ferrari, who eventually won, and Toyota, who could so easily have eventually won. Now, Toyota got on, on record stating publicly this weekend that there is almost no chance they're going to score points. So you can take that exactly as you wish to. We may see uh, Toyota being uh, very dominant. We may see Toyota not being very dominant. We may see a much more uh, even spread of performance across hypercar now that their initial knowledge advantage has been eroded by the newer teams having run their cars for a season but again genuinely we haven't got a clue we're going to have to tune in to find out so you too i'm afraid well with the checkered flag out at the end of the session it is nine of our 19 hypercars within a single second it is 10 of our lmgt3s within a single second and the ones after that for the most part are pretty small margins too yep. We started this show, Martin, by saying this is a truly exciting new era. We're in the situation where you run out of things to run out of uh, time to talk about the new things, rather than talking about uh, finishing the session, running out of new things to talk about. Well, I'm, ju I'm just, I'm, I'm just actually thanking the Lord that it's not just a four-hour sprint or something. We've actually got at least, probably, eight hours to to try and work through a few more of the new cars, the new teams, the new driver lineups, the, the who's done what with whom, and uh, Louise Beckett down in the pit lane getting ready to chat to Alex Lynn, the Cadillac topping the time sheets at the end of the session. we're going into uh, how does that feel for the team at the end of this session to be fastest uh, to be honest i think even from the prologue and even yesterday we've been feeling strong obviously i know there's a lot of other teams are looking good as well but you know actually our, our cadillac's really feeling good around this circuit the fast flowing corners i think it's really suiting us uh, so yeah fingers crossed we can uh, capitalize that now from for when it matters I'm looking forward to qualifying because, of course, we've got a different setup this year. Yeah, no, I, I mean, going to enjoy it. I think uh, I like the hyper pulse kind of sessions, and uh, yeah, brings a lot more excitement. And yeah, I like a bit of qualifying. Uh, who will be qualifying? Myself. Okay, good. Glad I asked. Yeah, yeah. no, it should be fun. It should be fun. All right, thank you. Thank you. Now, is that because A comes before S? <laughs> I mean, genuinely, some teams will will pre-season have said, you're doing it here, you're doing it here, you're all, or where do you think you might be best with the car? Or they'll just take it in rotor, or they'll just decide at the weekend who's had the best feel for the track, or, you know, there are all sorts of different ways of skinning that particular cat. It's not just as simple as the team feels that's the fastest driver mm -hmm. and therefore they're going to do qualifying. Like you say, sometimes it's on a rotor. Sometimes the drivers speak to one another and mm. be honest and open with each other and say, I know I was due to do qualifying this time, but I'm really not feeling it this weekend. I feel like your runs have been faster. You focus on the new tyre runs. 
and uh, and you step up for qualifying and you you make your own decision your own call between the three of you or two of you no matter which you how, how you're running that particular weekend in which car crew so the team can make a, 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 some kind of a plan sometimes drivers feel like before even going to a circuit that they're going to be better off at that track so like for me for example i always knew bahrain was a, a strong circuit of mine put me down for qualifying bahrain the team yeah yeah okay yeah bahrain's a good one for you so it, it um, can be a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. If you feel you're going to be good, actually, you're usually right. And, and also, if, 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 you, if you don't are, like the track, you're usually right too. And if you start off with that plan, say Le Mans is the critical one because it's, it's time limited. Mm. And if you focus on one driver doing the new tyre runs, you just get them into the groove before. And, and now, more so than ever, it's, it's important to do that with the hyperpole. You have to be in that top 10 okay. in the first shootout before going into uh, the hyperbole later So on. much pressure, so much pressure in qualifying because there wasn't enough before, Graham. We've just seen a run down all the times in that session and it was a tenth here, half a tenth there, a couple of thousandths elsewhere. elsewhere. Two tenths was actually quite a big gap in the field in that, well, uh, the in thing that, that session. The thing that really sums that up to me, you've got one of the, the Jotas in P3 with Nato there at the end. And the other Joe, you have to look all the way down to P80 uh, for car number 38. Yeah. Out of 19 cars. Yeah, so yeah. They're, they're surrounding the field, basically, almost fastest and almost slowest. So, but again, different different strategies going on, splitting the, the work between the two. And, and again, there's the advantage of two cars, you know, splitting your development between two teams. Right, you guys are going to do long run, you guys are going to do this, you guys are going to do a quali sim, and we'll put all the information together, and both cars will benefit from both sets of data. But in seasons of old in the World Endurance Championship, when Toyota ran their two cars against privateer teams, mm you would see two Toyotas just top the timesheets, yes. regardless of their program. Yep. And there would be a second or maybe two, two and a half seconds between them. They'd still be at the top of the timesheets. Gone are those days. Whatever else happens with the Peugeots, I want that rainbow array on the back of the car to stay. I don't, I don't care what, what else they need to do to make it perform. It's, I, it's just, start, I what, don't know who came up with that. It's a gorgeous bit of livery. What it's missing more than anything else is not the rear wing. It's something that we can tell the two cars apart. <laughs> 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 well, maybe they can rainbow color their wheel nuts to make it easier for us, us to identify at 190 miles an hour. Everybody getting ready to do their final uh, driver practice changes. <laughs> Um, the end of FP3. Well, and you've, now, you've now seen the new look to the FI World Endurance Championship, uh, lit large for the 37 car grid. Gentlemen, what do we think? Oh, I think it, it looks, looks stunning. It looks spectacular. <laughs> I love the look of the new GT3 cars, actually. I was a little bit yeah. apprehensive last year, waving goodbye to the GTEs, but looking at them in the flesh yesterday, going through scrutineering, they're absolutely beautiful machines, and they look great on track as well. Yeah. Well, let's hear from Alex Riveras down in the pit lane at Heart of Racing. Alex, uh, first round of the season. The car seems to be working very well, the 24 uh, version of the Aston Martin. How did it go so far? Have you shown anything, everything yet or not? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in the first round of could be one of the most uh, exciting uh, WEC seasons so far uh, with so many different cars and a new class, the GT3. LMGT3 that seems to be so competitive with so many cool cars out there and many different potential winners. It's a, it's a pleasure to be a small part of, of what is a, a dream come true in terms of a, of a championship. The, the weekend so far has gone very well for us. Uh, problem free, but you know, touch wood because it's still, uh, still a long way to go. Ready for quali? Well, yeah, Ian is going to do quali, but the car is ready. Ian is ready and uh, we'll look forward to, to see if we can make it into the Hyper Bowl and hopefully have a good starting position for, for tomorrow. Thank you, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, too, in the uh, pit lane. And I'm glad to see it's not just us. We are overexcited, like kids in a sweet shop where the door's been locked behind us. But I'm glad to see that the teams and the drivers are so overexcited as well. Qualifying will come up at 15.50 local, that is 12.50 Greenwich Mean Time. Wherever you are, please join us via the WC app. You can go and download it now in plenty of time. And so that will be in just a little under four hours time for qualifying. Till then, from all of us here, bye for now.